So my name is Isabel Tuipelo. I'm the executive director of DIVAN, the Diasporic Vietnamese Artist Network. I'm also a professor of Asian American Studies and Vietnamese American Literature at San Francisco State University. Welcome to the Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all over the world. What does it mean to be Vietnamese for you today? Well, thank you for the questions. So uh, as you know, um, I have a, uh, I'm of mixed race, right? My mother is Vietnamese, my father is uh, French. Um, for me, so because I'm mixed race, I've looked differently. Uh, as a child, I look very Asian and as a, you know, became an adult, my, my look changed. So it, I grew up in France uh, and in France, I look very Asian, very different. So I was, every day I was reminded that I was different, that I was Asian. And actually I was called Chinese, uh, you know, because people did not have the word for Vietnamese. Um, and so I grew up with a sense of not belonging to the country I grew up in. So uh, in that regard, to be Vietnamese is not a choice, right? It's something that come from the gaze of others toward me and, and reflected that. It was very negative. On the other hand, because my mother is Vietnamese and she was really the main caretaker uh, of me, she has a Vietnamese way that I have inherited, right? Uh, and in that way, when I'm with people from other cultures, I can see, I can feel the difference, right? right? So this is also uh, not a choice because I grew up as a Vietnamese daughter of a Vietnamese woman uh, and they close knit, right? Because it was her and I in the house kind of right. isolated from the rest of society. Another part to be Vietnamese as I grew and become to this country and it's more accepting of difference, especially where I live in San Francisco, I'm a little in a bubble in this country and in the work that I do. Um, to be Vietnamese American is also a choice, right? Uh, an intellectual choice because in some way I have the privilege to pass and move in different circles. So uh, because I'm conscious about the history of Vietnam, the history of France, the history of conquest and how a country um, gain power and some other country lose power, uh, I have made a conscious decisions to side uh, with Vietnamese American in the sense that I believe that those stories uh, need to be better understand, understood, uh, because if they're not, uh, it can lead to <clears throat> racist ideas, behaviors, and uh, harm. And uh, because I grew up uh, <clears throat> having experienced a lot of racism, um, I just met is also a choice to, to devote my career and my life work for to serve the Vietnamese American community. And that whether I whether or not I am accepted or not by that community, because I'm not idealistic, right? I just know having been also in the Vietnamese American communities, you know, for years when I first moved to these countries. Uh, to be mixed race is not always uh, well accepted, right? This is prejudice in the community as well. Right. So because I'm coming in between, in one hand, to be Vietnamese American for me is, is not a choice because this is how I was born and how I was raised and that's how I was looked at as others, but it's also uh, a conscious choice to identify it as Vietnamese American and side on the side on Vietnamese American community to serve it in a way that I think 
is beneficial for the group, regardless of uh, of judgments. Can I can I ask you? Was there a tipping point or a finite moment that made you come to that conclusion, or was it a gradual process that made you pick a side? Yes, so that's a very good question, Kenneth. So uh, it is gradual because um, you know uh, we may talk about identities. I mean, I was born and I grew up in France. And in France, you know, you can only say I'm French. You cannot say I'm Vietnamese Americans or, or French Vietnamese or French Asians. Growing up, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I was born in the mid sixties, right? Uh, there was not that language. So if you don't have that language, you don't have that kind of awareness of identity, right? I'm French, although I'm not treated as French, but that's the only thing that exists and, and you can consider. But somehow I made it to UC Berkeley and I took classes at first actually in the French um, departments, but I gravitated uh, to Francophone literature, reading uh, stories by people who are colonized, right, by the French. So my consciousness actually started in those classes um, by, you know, taught by faculty from Haiti's, uh, you know, people who've been colonized by the French and reading those texts, discussing this text. And actually at the beginning, I will have arguments with my teachers. I remember Marie Condé with but head because I could not see that perspective because I had my mind was colonized, right? My mind was a product of French societies. And but I kept picking her classes and those class and I kept butting head. And um, and I started to also get active, um, um, you know, in, 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 you know, I always go to protest, you know, I yeah. just always do. <laughs> and then uh, taking a classes in Asian American studies and ethnic studies, right, looking at the perspective of the world from the per uh, perspective of people of colors. And slowly, it started to sink in that, um, that what I thought I knew wasn't. And I think in the process of learning, you have to do a lot of unlearning. I think that's something that we forget to talk about. Right. And it took a lot of unlearning for me to make this conscious choice. And when reading Vietnamese American texts, because I wrote my dissertation, my PhD dissertation on Vietnamese American literature, when there were no, the field did not exist, no faculty have right. you know, discussed those texts or thought, thought about those texts. And you know, the field did not exist. And I, I did it because maybe I didn't know any better. Uh, but when reading those stories, I could also, identified with uh, with some writers and who thought deeply about becoming Americans from Vietnam and um, and thinking as I analyzed them how how does they how do they get there how do the identity shape and by writing about it, thinking about it, reading theory that trying to explain, identity formations, my consciousness slowly changed, but it's very slow and it's not a straight line, you know, and I have contradiction of my own, right. that I, 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 I catch it sometime and sometime I don't, right? But I try. So when you tell me about a process of many years of changing and evolving, immediately what I think about is today, Everything's very polarized because of algorithms on the computer. And I bring this up all the time. And we don't have an opportunity to really have long discussions to talk about the evolution of, of a person like you or a Vietnamese American like me who was born with both Vietnamese parents. We, we, we have struggles. And I think that it's never black and white. And the problem is we are expected to pick a side so often. And we don't have a chance to really air out 
all of the contradictions and the ironies of our existence as these immigrants. Uh, so I really value hearing what you're saying today, um, understanding it as a as a long process. Um, and it sounds like it continues to change, right? Yes, and it's always changing. You know, what I wrote 10 years ago, it may be different than I will write now. Mm. Uh, it's not only do we have to create a space <clears throat> and dialogue, you know, to have dialogues and discuss those things. But uh, one thing I had to do is um, push the field in which I write to analyze and discuss Vietnamese American literature, right? Because um, the field of Asian American studies is also a product of its time. And uh, for example, um, you know, when I went to Berkeley, when we look at the text by Asian Americans, you know, we look at it, oh, this is a good text because it resists and fights um, racism. Or oh, this is a bad text, you know, we condemn this text and make this argument is, you know, that we, we, you know, it's not a good text because uh, it, it accommodates to white patriarchy, right? And here I'm looking, you know, you know, because of my background and you know my my complexity, I wrote that I look at the text, and I'm say, wow, well, yes, here these stories, you know, there's a lot of um, resistance to white racism, but here in that story, there is less resistance toward patriarchy. Actually, there's a lot of liking patriarchy because it's character benefit from it. And then here there is also part of the story when it's ambivalence right. and it's messy and yeah. it's complicated. The person is like, who am I? fluctuate and the relationship to the self to power fluctuate is not black and white and also for Vietnamese Americans right because the field of Asian American study was about you look at stories and aspect of the stories in order to show how Asian American contributed to America right it's about um, it's about the domestic it's about America and what happened to the story where also part of the text, the, the concern is not so much about um, becoming America or claiming America, maybe it's more about figure out the past, you know, why am I here? You know, something about the past is not digested and there's a strong relationship to Vietnam. Right, and maybe because it's about the force nature of, you know, people have to live by force and didn't want to come here. So there's a unique relationship to Vietnam. But all of this, <clears throat> the field was not, didn't have a language to discuss transnational links, or it was like, you know, there was actually resistance. And you don't talk about those things because, you know, that's people who can travel, this is elitist, you know, what, 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 you know, what we are about is about fighting America is not, and that's it, fighting the racism in America. But here, in order to make space, even in academia, you know, I, I mean, what I did in my work, I don't know if I articulated it well enough, but I really had to, to, you know, I wanted to make room for gray areas, you know, for, the messiness of identities in on about the contradictions that are in the text that you and I have, you know, I mean, culturally, but also identity wise and a relationship to white Americans, African Americans, to Vietnam, uh, to parents. It's, there's ambivalence, there's contradictions it doesn't fit <clears throat> in the domestic paradigm of the field of ethnic studies or Asian American studies at the time. So we had to enlarge the field to make room for our complex identity. 
and this is uh and i don't know you know i just hope and i think it's healthy i don't think it's unique to vietnamese but i think in 2021 we, we can afford discussing a differences yeah i i think uh discussing the differences is is key to, to really to everything to being a humans and i think that's so lost and i hope that this whole uh polarization or polarizing of our communities of of even american politics vietnamese american politics mm -hmm. it it it's we are given a space as we're continuing these next few years to to open up and, and really discuss these things how did your mom and dad meet <laughs> well um my father is a french teacher was a french teacher so um he was teaching french in saigon uh, called ho chi minh city now um at some point he was a director of the french cultural center um, in Saigon. And then uh, my mother was a student uh, and took his class. And um, uh, the story is that, um, mm, yes, at the, at the end of the semester, end of the class, I think my father asked my mother if she wants to meet her at the pagoda at five. And uh, my mother went back to her you know, school, you know, um, the other students in the class, I say, why did the teacher want to meet me at five o'clock in the morning in the pagoda? Maybe really interesting in praying. And uh, <laughs> the, the praying. students say, no, the pagoda is the name of this kind of hip, you know, like this cafe that uh, the French likes to go. And <laughs> I bet it's at 5 p.m. <laughs> uh, so, after the class, I think they did hang out. That's how they met. And did your mother's parents uh, have an issue with them hanging out? Yes, my parents, my, my, my grandparents had issue about hanging out. Uh, at one point, my father went to visit the house, uh, her brother, and asked to marry my mother. And uh, my uncle uh, said no. <laughs> You could be her grandfather. You could be her father. <laughs> You're too old. And then it didn't add that, you know, in addition, but being too old is also French. And I believe my uncle were, uh, fought the French. So oh, wow. between, yeah, between um, those two, uh, yes, let's say absolutely not. Okay, so how did it eventually work out? <laughs> I'm writing a book about it. I'm trying. I have to <laughs> follow up story. with these questions, right? I mean, unless you don't feel comfortable. Yes. Um, well, I'm going to give you a short version uh, how they get together. Um, well, the politics. Uh, I think. No, stop this. Okay. Uh, so uh, my uncle, who say no to my father, uh, he got to go, because he worked for the Ziem regime. And, you know, he was in the military, uh, maybe an officer, maybe in intelligence, I don't know. Um, but he got a mission to go to the US uh, and then he could bring his family, plus one person from his extended family. And he picked my mother uh, it's, my mother she has eight sisters and one brother. And the brother is the older son. My mom, I think, is number eight. Uh, she she say she he picked her because she was the best student, so the best something. Uh, maybe he picked her because to make sure she doesn't go out with my father. You know, I don't know. You know, these different versions, but uh, but because of this choice, she was able to get a passport to come to the U.S. Uh, but uh, the plan didn't go through because President Ziem was assassinated, and so my uncle did not go to the U.S. 
uh, but my mother has a passport and she found uh, a sponsor and somehow she got in a plane with nothing, no, no, no suitcase, no nothing. I don't know if her family will ever prove and got herself to the US. So she was arriving here, I think in 1963 wow. with nothing in, in um, uh, you know, in uh, uh, Tiburon, you know, near San Francisco. She was one of the first Vietnamese here and it was very hard for her. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. So she gets on the plane and how old is she at the time? Oh, she's early 20, um, no, 23 something. And she's really young because she's very protected in a traditional Vietnamese family. So she really never, she had to be home all the time. So, so here she is, you know, like imagine, you know, in 1963, no Vietnamese in Tiburon. Did she have a plan? I mean, or was it like her and your father sort of said, hey, we'll meet in Tiburon and, you know, we'll create. No, they're not supposed to talk. They're not supposed to talk because the family did not approve. OK, so she just left with. So no. You went to France and say goodbye. Right. And and that's it. I mean, yeah. And then, yeah. Uh, so. So she found a sponsor who lived in Tiburon, who was in the army and she lived with the sponsor and they had a family. And she's, uh, but the sponsor was in the army, American army, right? A white a colonel. But when he came home, his wife had a baby. You know, they've been apart more than nine months. So they had problem, the couple had problem. Mm -hmm. And there's drinking and fighting and my mother is in the middle of that. So that's not so good. So she found the neighbors to go and babysit and she wanted to go to school, right? Because she really wanted to get educated and, you know, she's very, yeah, that's what she wanted. Uh, she had a high school degree in, in Vietnam already from what she says. And, and the colonel put her in a, you know, sent her to high school in Tiburon, American high school. And up to this day, she's very upset with him because she say she should have been placed in ESL uh, classes because she didn't speak English or very, very little. So although she was a senior in high school and went back to high school, she didn't understand the word <laughs> of what's happening. And she likes to have good grades. She seems to have good students and she couldn't. And then, uh, you know, American families, is, is, you know, she was supposed to be in charge of those teenagers who kind of, I don't know how much authority she had on them. Uh, the, the previous family fought a lot. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, it was, she, she didn't feel like she, you know, what happened if she failed high school? What about, you know, what, what this is going to do? Um, I mean, there's more to it, but I'm yeah. going to stop here. And so then, yes i'm sorry so my father my father i don't know so you know i mean if i you know as i write the story i'm finding wait a minute who found who right mm -hmm. so i think my mother had the address of my father and she wrote to him and so he found her so he wrote to her and say oh you know if you want you can go to france i just bought the house and you know it could be with me uh, and eventually she, I don't know how, because, you know, supposed to be without education, without language, but somehow, because my father lived, yes, he had bought a house, but he was living with his parents and he was, okay, it's more complicated, uh, in a little village in north of France. So next thing you know, she was able to get on a plane to Paris, get a train, to another town and find some kind of transportation. And here she showed up in North of France in 1964 wow. with a white eye eye. And then for more effect, she put a conical hat and a purse <laughs> and a high heel. <laughs> and it was cold. And it was, <laughs> you know, <laughs> she looked like coming from Mars. It would have been the same thing. Yes. And the father, who now suddenly looks really old in France, with his really old parents who live with him uh, in a big house, but no heat, uh, it was a shock. 
And then they stayed uh, and they had you, right? And you were, you were... They had me and they stayed. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't have any siblings, right? You're the first, you're uh, their only child? From them, yes. But my father had another family with three kids. Got it, got it. And uh, are you, are, are you, were you very close with your father growing up? <laughs> um, we fought. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, um, he's, my father is 30 years older than my mother. Uh, you know, basically, he's born in 1910. Wow. So he's and he spent his formative years in the colonies, 26 years in the desert in Algeria, and the rest of his adult life in Vietnam. Uh, so he has a lot of 19th century ideas and really kind of out, you know, been out of French societies for all of his adult life. And uh, yes, and he wanted my mother and I to be there in the house for him for his old age and take care of him. And uh, as a kid, uh, we were close because uh, I love nature. I love nature. He's kind of a poet, a dreamer. He um, liked to read. He had a library. So in a way, we had similar affinities. Um, uh, except that I, I did not, when he told me I was supposed to be his cane for his old age, um, I had a bit of a reaction. How old were you? When you said <laughs> because, that? Uh, yes, and then not allowed to, 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 you know, just have to be home for him. So it's about I, him. How old were you when he said that? Or did you realize that you were the cane for his old age? As a teenager, you know, because, uh, yeah, I did ask some question and it was clear. Um, and, you know, I love the country. I love the nature. But, um, you know, I, as a teenager, I like to, I wanted to try to have friends, yeah. Yeah. Have boyfriends and all of that. So that was a problem. And so your mother figured out something. How did she get? Because I've I've uh, I've I've listened and watched, or, or or read that she sent you to the U.S. to be with her family, oh, with a one-way ticket. How did that even? How did she even manage that? Yes. So, <laughs> so I'm amazed about sometimes you know Vietnamese woman. I mean, I don't want to generalize, but so I will say my mother and her sisters, maybe I'll go as far as that, uh, who have to be in a very patriarchal, patriarchal structures. And in addition with my father, he was a colonial structure, right? Because he was a teacher, the French teacher. So she acted the part of <laughs> the woman, it, thought an Asian woman is, right, which is to please, she's happy if she please him, and, and that's it. And also, she able to mimic the, what he expected Vietnamese persons to be, which is submissive, submissive. And, and, you know, He's his authority figure and is the one to make decisions, mm -hmm. which is the one to listen, right? But what happened when you're born and raised in this kind of structure where power is already dictated, when your inner self is actually extremely strong and you have some, you know, you're not passive, you're actually quite driven, aggressive, you are you know what you like, and yet every day you have to mimic, you know, what is expected of and what you're taught. Um, so my mother is a master, <laughs> I will say, as having what she wants, uh, but you know, the other thing 
that's what that's they're doing. So um, in 1975, right, is the end of the Vietnam War. Well, um, I think it caused a lot of stress for her. I was 10 years old. Um, there was a huge issue of domestic violence in my house, right? My father with me and my mother. I don't know how, I didn't know about the war, but when I put the two and two together, it was 1975 and that's the end of the war. And maybe my mother thought um, she could not go back, right? So maybe something flipped in her. Hmm. And I cannot say it was a happy situation for her to be with this older Frenchman. Uh, who did not allow her to leave the house, right? So if she go to buy from food, you know, she had 30 minutes or 45 minutes, right? Because you really, yeah. you know, there's a lot of jealousy between those two and a lot of control. So I don't, and then he's very authoritarian, angry and all of that, right? That's how he, he uses power to, to control the household. So, so because of those incidents of, of violence in the house, and I don't want to get too much into it, I think she decided when I was 10 that uh, the only way for, for her to be out of France, to get out, is through me. And then somehow she'll find a way for me to think that I want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> wow. uh, that I will go to the US and sponsor her and get successful and, and take care of her and she'll be back to America because she always had this dream to make it to America and she felt like she failed she got stuck in France she didn't want to be there you know she had a baby she was stuck and and a family as refugee will come to the US and she wanted to go back to be with her family in the US. Got it. So for 10 years, she thought about it. She thought about it. And somehow, when I turned 19, when she got me this ticket, I took it. And I went to the US. Um, there was no language. She never explained any of this in words. But uh, it was clear there was nothing for me to be back in France. I knew there was this one ticket. I had no visa, I had no paper, I had no money, I had no language, I had no education. I have no backup of any kind from her because she, she has nothing for the family. So that was my mission. I've been carrying her uh, all my life. But wait a minute. So, and I did it. But, it. but in high school, didn't you go to school with some sort of ambition from your mom or, or any dreams? What, what was going on mm -hmm. in your mind at 12 years old or at 15 years old? You know, I mean, it's hard to imagine a Vietnamese woman who's sort of at that level of, you know, experience is going to let you not think about your future. Well, um... You asked very good question. You're a very good interviewer. <laughs> There's a lot of secrets in this family. It's complicated, right? And to be a writer, to be a storyteller, you end up, you know, betraying everyone. So as soon as I speak, I betray. It's very difficult. Uh, but having said that, um, um, no, I was... I didn't know about anything about America. I had no intention to come to these countries, like none of that. The thing is, growing up, I was called Chinese, you know, like bully, like daily. I was a very good student. I liked to read, you know, I had nobody to play with. So all I had to do is read, you know, and do my homework and, and, and climb the trees and, and be in nature. You know that and be with animal that really helped me uh, and then uh when i was 16 um more violence happened toward me 
right, in the village, right, the man in the village, right, I was very, very vulnerable. So then I stopped being a good student. I went from being an A student to, I don't, I don't give a fuck, you know, I'm, I'm done. I didn't want to live anymore, right. So, so then there's no, and then my father, and nobody in my father's family ever went to university. So, so the mixed race kid, there's no way that kid is going to go in graduate from high school because none of the French family members have, right? And because they also look at me as the other, right? And then I start to not go to school. I went to ride horses instead, right? I went to climb the tree with my poetry, write poetry. So I was really at risk. So, so my mother didn't think I would graduate from high school. Nobody thought I'd graduate from high school. I didn't think I'd graduate from high school because I didn't do my homework. But when the, uh, and then I didn't go to class, actually. I, I quit, I didn't care. So, um, um, but a few, few months before the, the baccalaureate degree, um, I met a friend. French friends that was nice to me she's kind of an artist and she was a very good student so to be liked by her I said well I better you know do a little bit better and then I, I did for four months I put my nose in the books and then I did almost caught up on four years of <laughs> high school education I mean I did what I, I did as much as I could and I did so my mother told me here I give you a ticket to to U.S because you're going to fail your high school exam and then you do your 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 study over there with my sister and then a year later you come back and you take your test again right and that was the idea of why i'm going to the us uh and then to everyone's surprise i graduated from high school you know i i, I passed the test um and and then what this is a plan is no more planning but my friend but there was no plan for me to go to university it was too far in the village right french education is free but we have to pay for the dorm and my father doesn't spend a penny on us right and there was not even discussion for me to go to school so if there's any these discussions is for me to he was trying to match me some older men in the village right who had land and my father liked land and, and that was it, right? And I don't want to marry the old man. So I got the ticket. Um, um, I mean, I had the boyfriend, which you know I would have liked to continue, but now I have this ticket uh, to one way ticket to go to the US and I went and it was very poor. It was a ref Vietnamese refugee family. They had domestic violence there too. It was complicated. They sent me to work as manicured, but there was a warmth there that I did not experience growing up with my family. And that uh, gave me, that saved me. Yeah. No. So although there was cockroaches everywhere and it was very you know, complicated, as it, it was still so much better. Now, when you say warmth there, do you mean like from the kids that were in that family and or the... No, my aunt. My aunt was nice to me. She was motherly to me. She talked to me. She laughed to me. She hold me. She she, mm -hmm. she she kissed me like Vietnamese, you know, sniff me, you know. She, yeah. she, 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 she was motherly. My mother is not motherly. So, yes, at first, yeah, yeah. So, so, so it was better for wait, me wait. to be there. And there was no, and it was no alternative of what else to do. You know, there was no vision. I didn't know about university. There's no, yeah, there's none of that. So it's between living in poverty in Los Angeles, right? Or being in France uh, with my father and, that was better. What did you say at first? Did you just say at first, uh, like the tenderness, oh, the warmth? You're good. <laughs> you're good. <laughs> <laughs> well, the sister had some 
politics. They had issue that I did not know because my my mother <clears throat> she left <clears throat> and and then the grandma did not want her daughters to take off with the foreigner. So and then my mo and my aunt is number nine. And they look alike. The very beautiful woman. I don't know how to stop this. And then. Uh, so she, the grandma, married off my aunt number nine to this man that not very, you know, not very good looking and not that she cared much about him because she had another boyfriend, but she had to. And then now my mother sent her daughter, who is a little bit of a mess, I have to say. And, and my mom, my aunt might have some resentment to her sister, say because of her, she had to marry this man. So. So it became complicated. Hmm. It became complicated. Her relationship with me, I realized it's not so much about me. It's also her relationship with her sister, which, you know, a politic started, you know, before I was born. Hmm. Uh, so, so all the other niece and nephew were sent to community college. I went sent to work as a manicurist. And also mixed race, you know, I'm called Kulang, you know, it's not like people say, you know, what's wrong with you? You tell the truth, you know, I come from the village, you know, it's just, it's just like seeing a really stupid one. And when you started your work uh, as a manicurist, uh, at the time, um, in your mind, what was this like, okay, this is a career path, uh, this is something that you're, what was going on in your mind? I'm not expected to have a career. I have, um, you know, my father, my nickname by my father is Bonarien, means like good for nothing. So I thought I'm good for nothing, right? Uh, so once you believe that, that's it. So his no career path is, is my aunt say, okay, you get a job, get to, she, she I, I didn't get a training i didn't get a license you know it's like she showed me a little booklet if you give me a plastic hand practice the next day i'm on the job and it trained to listen my first page my first client went home with a band-aid i cut her <laughs> i've never done nail in my life from <laughs> like and how long did you do that for uh, a year or two, yeah, and then, and then, yeah, and then all the other girls by my age, I mean, I said young woman, all Vietnamese and all been boat people, they all been raped, and, uh, you know, I learned uh, English uh, with them, you know, doing the feet of those uh, white ladies in Hermosa Beach, you know, blonde ladies. And I learn English, yeah, with a Vietnamese accent, actually, at first. Although I don't speak Vietnamese. You have an insane story. I, it's crazy good. I mean, the, the, the things that are, I'm, <clears throat> I'm just kind of uh, blown away. <laughs> I don't even know. You're a good I'm... listener. You're a really good listener. I'm impressed with you. Thank you. I am so, I'm so uh, I have obviously these questions that I prepared, but now I have about four other questions just based on the last five minutes of, of talking to you. When did you decide that you need you need to go to back to school? <laughs> oh, um, well, first of all, I, I express desire to go to school. Uh, I mean, I would say, you know, I think I, it was not easy for my Vietnamese family to have me there. I mean, I was a little, <clears throat> I mean, because I was so free in the village, right? I'm always climbing everything. I was a climber. Everything I see, I just climb. I want to go, I just hitchhike everywhere, right? I go to Los Angeles, I want to go somewhere, I hitchhike, you know? I go in the sun, right? Because it's like, right? So I was a headache. And then and then and then men will come and you know want to to sing by the window, right? <laughs> With the guitar. <laughs> Vietnamese man. I'm like, what is this? You know, those French songs from the 
practice, you know? It's like, <laughs> it's like oh. So I think it was not easy, I have to say, to, to, to you know, my grandma, I was too dark, you know, my, you know, hitchhiking in LA in the 80s, I thought, my God, I'm going to get killed, right? You know, to have flowers and men singing by the windows, you know? I mean, I, I was not allowed to meet people, but people will find and they will do all those things. <laughs> so, so I think it was a headache for them. Um, but I wanted to go to school after a year and a half or something of being a manicure. You know, I wanted to say, oh, is there something else I could do? Uh, I mean, I went to technical school because um, uh, they say, well, maybe, you know, for a woman to become a computer um, um, programmer, it might be good, right? Because, you know, it's more clean and you don't need English so much and you do that. So, so I did that. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I did that. Uh, uh, but, you know, I have this... Huh? In LA? Yes, in Los Angeles, but it was, the students were poor white and people of colors, and maybe, you know, um, we'll get to that later, but I told you, you know, in France, I was very, always touched by injustice, you know, like stories of injustice, of movies, you know, there's a lot of discourse politically about class struggle in, in France, or, you know, I'll go to protests. So everything that has to do with mm -hmm. unfairness and injustice, it touched the core in right. me, right? Um, well, next thing I know, it's like, well, that school is, you know, take a lot of money from those poor people. And what are we learning? And I feel like we were used and taking the money, but there's no way that we're going to get a job after this. So coming from France, I said, well, this is unfair. This is not right. Let's strike. So I organized a strike <laughs> in the school with some group of people because <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I have these things. No, if it's not fair, we're going to fix this. And I didn't know Americans don't do strike. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so, I, so I, I did get my degree and I did work as a computer person for a while. It was, it was uh, you know, it's, it, uh, that's another story. Uh, but eventually I wanted to get more educations and I want to leave the family because it was, it was, I mean, I don't know what, I never knew what's good for me, but I knew, always knew what is not good for me. And um, uh, my family didn't, I wanted to move out. I think I turned 24 and find something else, but my aunt did not want me to leave um so i ran away i mean i didn't she took my passport my money and i, I left in the middle of the night uh through the window okay well, let's go back to a, a few <laughs> <laughs> we we'll have to get back to i want too many people to know about this okay i mean <laughs> I'm going to stop telling too many stories because I love to tell stories, but. Uh... Well, we have all day. I mean, this is what this is for. This is what this is for. If you're open to it. Right. Uh, so you because I want to go back to the passport, uh, your aunt, and I even want to know like what the relationship is today. But we'll get to that later. I, I want to know um, because obviously you have this very intellectual background, but it didn't start out that way. And then now I'm finding out that it, you went to a technical school, but what technical school is very important because I, I, I want to get to, to the bottom of this. Okay. Did you go to like a DeVry or an LA technical Institute, like where national or what, where did you go? Because what I want to know is, did they offer classes in liberal, uh, you no. know, humanities? No. What, what did you learn there that made you go? I want to go to the next level and go to Berkeley and no, 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 none of that, none of that, none of that. No, all I, we've learned is computer programming and then uh, business management a little bit, although, you know, 
Um, no, none of that. Um, the name of the school, I don't remember, but I think I might have a black mark there because of, you know, I, I thought, you know, a part of the strike, I said, nobody pay until we get what we want. So, so it's okay. I don't remember the name of that school. Um, but um, uh, no, I didn't get any of that. So basically, to, but I can tell you where I started, and I think I mentioned it before, but again, nothing is a straight line when, you know, I mean, I see, you know, my kids here, you know, everything is like thought out for them, you know, you do this and do that, you go to college, you know, for me, it was nothing of that. Um, but I did run away in the middle of the night and I went as far as I could go with the money I made that night by selling a watch to whoever, you know, a person who came pick me up to take me to Green Island stations. Uh, it was $60. And with $60, I went to San Jose and I arrived in the middle of the night and then I made it from there. Um, and why San Jose? I, I had a cousin there. And then as, as $60 is as, as far as, you know, I could get a ticket, you know, up to San Jose. After that, it's more expensive. So I don't have the money. Uh, so, so, yeah, so I started from that. Uh, uh, I went to event, you know, I started to work as a bagger in a in a in a supermarket, clean up the supermarket at night, you know, in fries in Fremont. Uh, rented a room $50 a month. Um, you know, again, you know, I have to think that uh, I was very at risk, you know, a young woman with no papers, no money in the house, there's no key, you know, it's like, I've been very lucky. I mean, I, I got hurt along the way, but overall, I think I've been very lucky as well. Um, uh, I, w I wanted to learn English. So I took a class in the, in the adult school and then an English class. And then since it was cheap, I took a math class, you know, so, <laughs> so that's it. And then I had no ambition. But the teacher from that community college, you know, because they would write essays. And then in that other school, you, you know, what I wanted was not education. What I wanted is safety for my life, you know, for not to be harassed. Because, you know, I look a certain ways, you know, I was like, people, men look at me, I'm like this target, right? Um, very objectified. And, um, you know, and, and men had knife and, and, and weapon going to school, right? So I didn't like that. I didn't feel safe. Um, but the, the teacher, Miss Robert, uh, one day she told me, she wrote my essay and said, you know, Isabel, why don't you go to community college up on the hill? You know, I think you'll do well there. And I said, what is that? And she, she showed it to me, right? So that's why as a teacher now, I'm really pay attention to those, right? Because this teacher really helped me. So I went to community college in Fremont and I love the flowers there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's on a hill, you know, adult school is in the Simmons, right? It's, the community college was on the hills, there's green, there's water, there's flowers. Oh, this is much better. <laughs> so I find a way to take classes there, but it's very expensive as international students, right? So I work more, get three units, take a sociology class. Uh, and then I became very loyal to... So when I tell the story, I wanted to say, you know, what helped me also. So one thing helped me is... Um, I'm very loyal, you know, to people who help me or to something positive. So I became very loyal to my teacher who told me to go to community college. So once a week, I just go uh, visit her and, and just hang out with her. And we develop a very nice relationship. And she helped me with my English because my English was terrible. Um, so, and eventually in the house where I live, again, because there was no lock in my bedroom, it became unsafe for me. So I got trapped again. I said, what do I do? What do I do? So I also didn't want to live. You know, I thought, okay, now, now what? So, you know, I have a few, you know, yeah, I, I came to some roadblock, you know, along the way. But uh, I, there's some 
anyway, so I found a way out of you know that the, house. You know those pauses. I'm gonna hold myself back from not asking questions because I understand yeah. there's a struggle. You read my book. You read my book. Yeah, but I just want to call it out. Like I, I want to ask questions, but I won't because I think that you're kind of figuring out what what you can say and what you can't say, right? Like, yes. So. Uh, so I, I did up, end up changing situation, right? I didn't, I survived, I didn't die. I said, okay, what do I do? But I, I used to teach uh, French to somebody from the early college, uh, to this older man who's, who's from India, a uh, uh, Sikh, you know? Yes. Um, so I called and I said, well, Mr. Sidi, um, I, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, I need a place to stay. You know, do you know anything what they say where I am is, is not safe, I'm scared. And you say, oh, you can live in my house with my wife, my, my daughter, because it's older, you know, his, his daughter uh, went to UC Davis. You say you can live there. And then I say, well, but I have no money, right? You say, okay, well, then you be my, a cook, a chauffeur, and you take care of our business. Uh, every day, uh, they have a delic delicatessen, and you'd be the cashier, and you'd be the waitress, and then you can clean up, and then in exchange, you can stay for free in our house, which is safe, on the hill in Fremont. So I said, yes. <laughs> so next thing I know, I'm wearing the sari, <laughs> I'm learning how to make the Vietnamese, uh, the, 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 the Indians uh, bread, I'm chauffeuring, and I'm taking care of the, the deli. Right. I'm the, the waitress, I'm the cashier, I make the sandwich and I help clean up. And you're getting paid though, right? You I get... don't get paid. I just don't pay rent. But then how would you, what, what you spending money? Um, I didn't, I didn't make money. I got another job on the side. I did another job. Yeah, I, I, I just work all my way. So I, I did everything they wanted me to do, which is, you know, <laughs> actually, you know, they got a lot of my labor, I think, right? If you count it, but I needed a safe place. I never had a safe place right, for me. So I wanted, that was number one, when I can not be afraid. Mm. Right? And what, did it end up being a safe place? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes, but um <laughs> yes. Um the thing is uh well I'll just go back to education story <laughs> is that um one day I think I told a story elsewhere, the, the daughter uh, came back from UC Davis and, you know, and I was talking to her and say, well, what do you do? She said, UC Davis. I said, what is that? <clears throat> because I was taking classes in community college. And she said, um, and she tell me, and the Mr. City heard me talk to her. And she said, oh, Isabel, you don't need to know by UC. And he said, why? He said, well, it's not for people like you, right? Because I was a servant, basically. So, so, but whatever, I have my mother thing, right? To tell me, no, I'm, I'm, I'm interested. <laughs> if you say you cannot do it, I'm interested in whatever that is, I'm going to do it. So, uh, so I said, no, I, that's it. That's what I want. So I, I figured out what you see. I didn't know there was many you see. I only applied to UC Berkeley uh, and, and I, got in right so that's my path to education although i was interested in being a reporter because i like to ask questions you know get stories i don't want to talk you know just ask questions write it uh uc berkeley did not have journalism you know that was a problem right but i had to go to uc because not for people like me um and then uh, in terms of safety i was safe in the sense that nobody harassed me, but because the old man, I think was very depressed <clears throat> and nobody would listen to him because he talks forever. <clears throat> and because I was there, 
he talked to me. So I sit <clears throat> for hours and hours and hours listening to him talking about India every day. And, you know, complaining about here. And, you know, it's lots of nostalgia about India. And then I'm polite, you know, it's like, it's my boss. I'll just listen with my sari on. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, then the, I think the family started to concern to say, because he was so upset with everybody not listening to him and say, oh, the concern is going to, to put you on his will. And when I heard that, uh, by the next week, I moved out. I just didn't want to cause problem in a family. They starting to, you know, worry. So, so I, I, a week later, I was out of there because I, I thought, you know, no matter how nice I tried to be, I, it would, it would cause trouble. Uh, but it was nothing sexual. It was just this depressed. He had something to listen to, but the family was just wondering. So, so I left. Did you have a job lined up when you left or? Yes, I always had many jobs. Yeah, yeah. I always had backup plan and jobs. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. And uh, at that time, yeah. Did you keep in touch with the family after you left or that was no, it? No, because I felt very uncomfortable. Yeah. Because I thought, you know, it's not good for him to have his family question him that way. And then for them to see me that way, uh, no longer, I thought, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so and, and at that time, uh, were you out of the Fremont Community College at that time or you got admitted? <clears throat> yeah, community college. Yeah, I, I stayed there three years. It took me a long time because I worked because it was so expensive uh, and the international students. So I had to find way to get papers, visa, be legal, you know, that's another story. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when you were on this journey at the community college, uh, what was this sort of uh, understanding of where you were headed um, intellectually with the no, not yet. What? what it no, was... no, I just had to go to UC because not for people like me, but they didn't have any of things that I was interested in. So that was a problem. <laughs> So, so now what? Uh, but it was more flowers, more green, and I like that. Um, I was totally lost. It's like everything's so big, and it's like, oh, how do you go to one office to another? Oh, you know, I always have to figure out financial aid. You know, the mm -hmm. I, I got this at community college, but at Fremont, in 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 Berkeley, it was a little bit overwhelming. Yeah. It's a lot bit bigger waters, right? Mm -hmm. So once you get to Berkeley, uh... and I don't talk. Remember, I don't talk because in France, I didn't talk and I stuttered. I was stuttered when I left France. So I came into language through English to make a full sentence without stuttering. So my relationship to words, right, to to to, to words with the mouth, right, to speak. Is, is I was silent. I was, you know, I stopped stuttering, but I will not speak. And here in this country, as a student, you're supposed to speak. It's like a nightmare. Do you still stutter in French? No. I don't. But it... <laughs> My plan is to go back and tell them a few words. Have you been back to France? Yes, I do work with Diva in France. Got it, got it. Okay. Yeah, I so, still have a few bones to chew over there. We'll definitely get get into that uh, in a bit. So you you get to Berkeley, and you know you are you, you undeclared at that point? No, no. Yes, I went to rhetoric because I I heard it was easier to get to through rhetoric, but I don't care about rhetoric. So uh, I took French class because I thought it'd be easier to get an A. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> I took some anthropology class and that was cool because it was more like a reporter closer, but you don't have to, you know, and you travel. And then I was always very curious uh, about uh, different culture. So, and I was also very interested to everything that was visual. Uh, so I was, uh, you know, I was making film. I was very passionate about doing documentary. 
I love asking questions, catch the stories, put into videos. So that's what I wanted to do. And then my, and I got involved. So my 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 honors thesis at Berkeley uh, was um, I did a video about the the protest movements against uh, the war in Iraq, <clears throat> the, the the yeah the war the first war in Iraq. So I did that. So I will go to protest. Mm -hmm. You know, I always gravitate to protest. <laughs> This was in, and then uh, this was the late eighties. Yeah. Yeah. Late eighties, early nineties, early nineties. Yeah. I, um, can kind of track my past, uh, alongside yours with, um, uh, I was a cultural anthropology major at really? USC. Mm -hmm. Oh, so that's what it was a cultural anthropology major. Oh, yeah. I, where, where was it? At USC? USC, yes. Oh. Yeah, I was coming. Yeah, then, oh, yeah. yeah. Did you say? No, go ahead. I was leaving uh, the university when Viet Thanh Nguyen was coming in. I think we overlap uh, one year. He was beginning his career there as a, as a professor, and I was on my way out. Uh, we were, I was in the VSA, and he was uh, part of the VSA's, uh, you know, the teacher who's sort of like, I, I forget the title, but they watch over the Vietnamese student union. Is yeah, the mentor. Professor, yeah, Professor Ung, I think, from uh, electrical engineering. So the two of them were sort of in and out. And my brother was the president, and I was, uh, I graduated before, yeah, before I got to know Viet Thanh Nguyen. But we, we overlapped, and I, I got to meet him from that point. And, you know, so we stayed in touch through, throughout the years, or, you know, Facebook and, and stuff like that. Amazing, amazing. Well, yes. So after I graduated, I applied to visual anthropology at USC and I got in and I wanted to be there so badly. And I got in there at Stanford at Temple. I applied to those three. Oh my so God. I almost, I almost went there. For, for your graduate work? or For, for graduate your... work, yeah. What year was that? 92. Uh, okay. I graduated high school in 93. Mm -hmm. in high school in 93 and then but i went to marine into u.s marines from 93 to 97 and then why I, why did i do that yeah look at your face you're like why <laughs> <laughs> that's a long story it's a really long story yeah uh being ashamed of vietnamese being vietnamese i wanted to be white i wanted to be tall i wanted to stand up straight i wanted to had no direction in my life at the time mm. and um so i was walking at a tet festival in little saigon and there was a kind of short small like marine wearing his dress blue uniform and my eyes just you know followed when i walked by him and he said come here and so my brother and i both walked over and next thing you know i was mm. 17 just turned 17 and my mom and dad had to sign a, the contract for me uh, to go so that's and you know uh, and, they say, and they did it happily not happily no no they because they were like we left the war so you our children would never have to join the military so um and then the recruiter was a really smooth talking recruiter and he said you know vietnamese he's telling my my parents why it would be good for us and it ended up being a, a very good experience both for life um uh, but to understand the differences between sort of where the intellectual class today is and the military class and everything in between that viewpoint um, that happens within our Vietnamese community in relations to the politics. And so I understand it from from inside that world, the Republican, because, you know, I was Republican growing up and going into the Marines uh, and then gradually getting to USC, graduating, meeting a lot of the guys in the film industry coming out of USC because that, that was my career path to, to go into the film industry. So I've changed a lot. Uh, so going from one spectrum to the other. And so, so now I, I sort of see things um, in a little bit more broad um, perspective. Yeah. But yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I met, you know, people who have the similar background than you do, or at least the drive is similar. <clears throat> and not, you know, not happy to be Vietnamese men. 
and and it is often associated with anger you know it's a lot of anger behind you know that this emotion create but they don't seem to be to carry that from what i see from here that's a, a really good um observation well i think i've gotten sort of rid of it going back to vietnam a lot you know i used to go three or four times a year before covid and then i'm i kind of <clears> worked, <throat> worked through a lot of these issues but then meeting my 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 wife uh she's taiwanese and she doesn't carry the baggage of an asian american because she grew up in taiwan her formative mm -hmm. years born in the u.s but grew up in taiwan and traveling mm -hmm. back and forth a lot on her own without her parents to the US. Uh, so I began to learn that um, people in Asia, men in Asia, don't carry this burden. And I realized that, wow, it's a choice almost. If you can kind of understand it and if you see it, you can make a decision, but it takes a while to kind of, it's like a muscle. You have to work at it and you have to make a decision to not let it get in the way. And you have to like make these distinctions to separate being an Asian American man growing up in the 70s and the 80s in the United States. It's a different thing than being a Vietnamese man in Vietnam or a Taiwanese man in, in Taiwan. And the, the power <clears throat> that, it, that mm -hmm. you have, it's, it's very different. Yeah. It's a very different experience. It's very different. Yeah, well, that, uh, that's, uh, that says a lot about you because it's not easy because it takes a lot of catching. Yeah. But to, to have a different perspective uh, helps a lot, you know. Yes, and, and that's why I try to really be understanding to people of all political stripes, because I think that hmm. there's an evolution to everybody's life. I mean, you can go and evolve into becoming a Republican from a, from a Democrat and vice versa. Uh, I don't think that things are static, and I don't think everybody's life situation uh, is this, obviously, is not the same. So my job I think today is sort of like just to hear people's motivations and the way they think and not make any judgment and kind of use this experience just to learn and not put any color in anything kind of my goal it's just mm -hmm. to to hear and to allow people to speak up and 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 tell tell me why you have arrived at becoming who you are today mm -hmm. yeah this act of listening is very important and it's not very common to be very really listen yeah and be open yeah the deep so listening for that yeah, yeah deep listening yeah, deep listening so let's go back to your story <laughs> you know about my story um when you were this cleaning lady at uh, mr seti's house um how how do you think that has informed sort of your work today well well, it's a class issue, it's a race issue, it's a gender issue. So um, I'm quite mindful as a teacher of, um, of trying to do for students uh, who are see a potential but don't have, uh, you know, the privilege of having had this, you know, to, to be empowered basically uh, in themselves to, you know, to, to, to pay more attention. I'm really hyper aware of, of power issues, right? So I try to, to give that to students. And also in my work with Divan, um, <clears throat> I think one thing uh, that's been very important to me from the beginning is to be inclusive, you know, inclusive of different voices because it's not a given, right? Like mixed race, gay and lesbian, people who, <clears throat> minorities in Vietnam, et, even ethnic Chinese of Hmong and Mien, Cham, um, people who use the imaginations to create stories and it might fit with what the community wants to hear and it might not because by virtue of being creative, you you break boundaries, yes. you know, and you open things up to deep listening of the self. So, so I'm all, and that may be why my backgrounds uh, inform 
my insistence of inclusion of difference within a group that's seen as different from the outside, but also have uh, some yes. kind of uh, certain bias. So you, you finish up this degree uh, in cultural anthropology. Uh, do you take a break and you go work or do you apply for the PhD program right away? No, I did apply and then I did get married. And then my, hus my husband, you know, when I got accepted, uh, really didn't want to move. And I'm like, oh, so, so that's that end of discussion. So, uh, and I had a friend, I was doing film work. I was doing a documentary actually about diversity in, 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 in UC Berkeley uh, with uh, this uh, uh, students, African-Americans, uh, Jesse Ryan, uh, who was in uh, Atlantic studies. And he said, well, if you like to do film, Isabel, you can apply to UC Berkeley in ethnic studies and your husband don't have to move. And, and this make it easier for you. And I said, oh, sounds good. I mean, the deadline was passed, right? But uh, I did it anyway. Uh, and I just changed documentary film school to ethnic studies. And I really did not know much about ethnic studies. I just wanted to do what I wanted to do without displacing my husband uh, to make it comfortable for him. Uh, and I got accepted. Uh, it's just like after a few weeks getting in the program, I was told I had to be a professor and I cried. <laughs> I cried for six hours by the one that around the tree. I, I, can, I need to visit that tree one day because I was, as I say, you know, I went from a place where I was silenced, I stuttered, I came here to language, but it was never my space to speak. Mm. I could never speak in class. I would never say a word in group. I would never say a word um, with men. I would never say a word. You know, I would maybe like one on one with a girlfriend. I would speak, but that's about it. So, so the idea of being in the front of classroom <laughs> to speak was a a nightmare. I'd much rather go back and clean people's house or do people's feet than, wow. than speak in front of people that take notes about something I say because I don't see myself as an authority. I, I never seen anybody who looks like me as a place of authority. I just didn't have that identity, that sense of self. And the act of speaking in front of more than two people was a, I mean it was it was a phobia it was just it's like I cannot do this I don't mind working hard but I know I cannot do this and here I am <laughs> I have to do this so this was it was a total nightmare when I realized that and then I was, I was told you cannot make film or documentary and I say well that's what I trained for that was my passion so it was difficult yeah but uh, what, what, what was the first day of teaching a class like for you <laughs> so um <laughs> my first class was an asian american woman class and I, I didn't feel like i knew enough um and i didn't really get training for teaching um and next thing you know i have hundreds of students wow um so i, I got this long black leather boots and some a bit of black outfits kind of tight and then i will look at my my boots each time i speak before i speak and try to remember that maybe i'm somebody else that can do this and then you know before i always arrive late because i had to be in the bathroom for quite a long time i just get so much anxiety having to do this I, oh my goodness um um yeah okay, wait, yes. wait, wait, wait. why black boots why the black <laughs> clothes why you just mentioned something too why why did it have to be tight clothes what, what is what is okay, that about? i have a story but i don't know how much of a story you want to say so you want to hear story i mean i don't know how much time yes. we have okay. i mean not too tight but you know it was like this black things and you know it's like a costume to be somebody else yes but 
Where did that come from? So I have a story, but you know, every story comes from another story, but I had a job uh, in Los Angeles in Beverly Hills. Um, I used to go to the temple. I spent my 20s going to my, I mean, my time with my Vietnamese family going to the Buddhist temple. Anyway, somebody from the Buddhist temple introduced me because I need a job, as I need a job, introduced me to this lady in Beverly Hills, the Vietnamese lady. I arrived looking like Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> from a dress from the uh, from the you know the flea market yellow like this like that with a big belt my little white shoes you know my long hair no makeup and 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 that person look at this lady and say i want you to hire this girl but she was not happy but she owe him for something he did in vietnam whatever it is they had this thing that she had to listen to him I go to the store. <laughs> what kind of store was it? Leather. Mm. And suede. Black suede leather. She got me in. She said, girl. Yeah. <laughs> she went and got like pants tight, like sweating, you know, this V thing. I put it in the back. I said, I'm not putting this in the front. This big black belt, those high heel. I cannot do high heel, you know, from the country. <laughs> she got, I get out of, of, after an hour, she put a lot of work. She was really annoyed, you have to deal with me. <laughs> coming out from Alisa, Alisa in Wonderland, coming out as Lucy Lou. <laughs> you know, high heel, five inch. I can walk though, I just have to sit still. Black pants, black belt, big jade. I mean, the top, I mean, the V thing I put in the back, right? She put the makeup, she put the hair, she put some stuff on. I always wanted to, I was always a baggy clothes because I want to hide. I don't want to see nobody see my body. Here's like every tight, you know, like tight, tight, tight. I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, but I need a job, so I, 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 she taught me how to walk on a straight line every day. She make me walk on this thing, and uh, I sold a lot of clothes. Okay, so we got to go back to. So, so I got exposed to 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 black clothes yeah. in Los Angeles, where you know, and then I became good at selling. So, so maybe I had confidence at selling. Yeah. yeah. So what? What does that signify? I mean, could, you could have put on a business suit, right? And I don't become, know about business suit. You know I about only black know leather. About that. <laughs> black leather. <laughs> I mean, it was not like black leather, leather. You know, it was not like that. But it was all black. But I had the black leather shoes, like the tall one. And, right. and I had to peek at it to remember that I'm not this country pumpkin. And, and uh, this goes on for... Uh, days and weeks, this discomfort, but uh, yeah. at some point uh, you have to transition into a, a, a space of a little bit more comfort. And are you, are you comfortable yet? Or are you still, <laughs> is there still a lot of discomfort in the, in the teaching space for you? I came to, you know, the things that you're most afraid of and you're able to conquer gives you the most Power. reward. Right. So when I teach, uh, I just I still can believe I'm doing that. I go in the classroom and I start speaking and I'm like, oh, my God, I, I never take it for granted. And uh, a part of me love it. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely love it when especially when there's a good communication and connection with yes. students. Uh, Powering, right? Yeah, is 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 is. I get out of work. I'm just so happy. I just oh, I did it one more time. I never know if I can do it, but I did it one more time. Oh my gosh! Uh, yes, <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, so you're teaching uh, during this time, but you're now going into graduate studies. And when did it? Because uh, it, it's ethnic studies, but then you had to you had to zone in on a particular subject and I, I believe it's Vietnamese American writing right or Vietnamese, mm -hmm. Vietnamese American literature mm -hmm. 
How, what, what, what was the growth cycle, the evolution of that, of you arriving to pick that particular um, subject? Well, never, nothing is a straight line. Uh, well, since I did my undergrad as a cultural anthropologist, you know, ethnic study doesn't have a methodology, so you have to pick a methodology from another field. So I, I kept visual anthropology, mm. uh, I mean, anthropology. Um, but as you study anthropology further, um, there's a claim to science um, that a certain school of anthropology uh, abide to, and it become more and more dry and theoretical. And then one point, and then the politics behind anthropology, you know, what created anthropologies, right? How anthropology has been used during wars, right? Uh, to locate place to bomb, right? So, so at some point, uh, I just lost the drive to do anthropology. And then also I had a baby and I was a single mom. Um, so in graduate school, so I uh, couldn't go travel, you know, like anthropology, that's I thought it also make me travel. Um, um, I, I tried to pick up another skills on the side, you know, I only need a backup. So I, I did another training on the side because I was not sure if I could finish. Um, but uh, instead of quitting, I say, well, let's try to do something that resonates more with me because, you know, what, you know, what I, it's not what I had planned. I wanted to be a visual anthropologist, right? So I, I was trained to be an academic. It's not something I plan. Um, so then I switched to literature instead of quitting. And then things became much more easier. Uh, um, um, uh, and then I, I, I finished uh, and I got a job. There was only one job about uh, teaching Vietnamese American literature in a country where it's not to stick. So I had to finish earlier because the job was coming up up a year earlier than I oh, wow. thought I, you know, that I planned. So I, I worked really hard to finish. And when you got to do it, you do it. Uh, so well, I did it. At, at, at what point did you decide to do specifically Vietnamese American literature? And were there any driving writers that sort of inspired you to, to really go on that track? Yes, so when I decided to go to literature instead of anthropology, well, Vietnamese, and I was in Asian American studies, so Vietnamese American literature seems uh, I had a curiosity for it. And I started to join this group called Ink and Blood, which was uh, a group uh, of, of writers and journalists, people in the community, people who thought who have aspired to be writers. Uh, you know, Viet was part of this, right? Um, and then we start to organize events for writers because at the time, Vietnamese American writers uh, were not often invited to speak at panel of Asian American writers because of the politics. So, so we created our own. Um, <clears throat> so my affinity for Vietnamese American writers, my uh, the being in the field of Asian American studies, uh, being part Vietnamese, having I mean a lot of things I was writing before has to do with my mother. You know, I have this thing, I go around my mother, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I'm still going around my mother mm -hmm. <laughs> when I write, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's very central to, to, to some of my preoccupations or emotional makeup. Mm -hmm. um, uh, led it to, 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 to study Vietnamese American literature uh, it was 19, in 1994, there was a lifting uh, of the embargo with Vietnam and it did open more room for writers. Um, and uh, part of the uh, <clears throat> one writer in 1994 that, that came out is Nguyen Quy Duc, right, with the Where the Ashes Are, right? And he was part of this group of Ink and Blood. He was a leader actually, and then inspired all of us to do what we do now, actually. Wow. Um, and then at the time, <clears throat> they were uh, South Wind Changing, you know, um, uh, by Jade, uh, Jade Wynn. And then um, later on, you know, there's 
uh, well, I remember also reading uh, Lily Hayslip, right? Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, Heaven and Earth, uh, and then Land Cow with Monkey Bridge and Andrew Pham, uh, Catfish and Mandela. Uh, you know, they, they start, they wrote, you know, they, those books came out as I was writing my dissertations, you know, this poet, um, you know, Trong Tran, uh, Lindin, uh, you know, um, Andrew Lam, right, he was in this, uh, in the city talking to him. So there was not too many. There was not too many, right? So, so my approach to literature, so one thing is about maybe because of my class, because of my background, because I don't take no for an answer, so, you know, one thing that my literature professor would say, you know, you don't talk to writers, you know, the, the critic is the one who has authority about interpreting a text, you know, you, you don't ask. And then say, well, why not? <laughs> the writer may have some ideas about what, yeah. what, why they're writing. So I actually went against uh, the teachers and I always, as I interpret texts, I like to at least uh, do research uh, about interviews by writers, or I like to talk to writers. What did you mean by that? So I think, you know, I'm more likely to get it right if I understand the drive and the, you know, the, 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 the writer's interpretation of their own work. Uh, and then since my time was also, my social time was with writers, and I was trying to be a writer myself, uh, then it seems it just seemed right. And it, it did change me. Yes, I, I, I can imagine being around all that, the inspiration and, and all of these stories, they they do something to the way we look at the world. Mm -hmm. uh, Laylee Hayslip is an amazing uh, story. You know, I had her on the podcast and it was like a four hour uh, journey from someone who basically had no educational background for her to write that uh for her to write, do her work uh, it's it, it's in, it's really incredible when you when you listen to her journey of um it's very similar to yours i'm i'm drawn to that country no, it's not similar at all but yes i know what you mean similar in the way of not knowing that this was the, the yes. intellectual pursuit it was not something that was on the board <laughs> yeah. It was not on yeah. your vision board with a Cadillac and a, a white picket fence. It, none of this <laughs> no. planned or envisioned in your <clears throat> in your mind. So yeah. it, that in in that a aspect very similar to uh, to to Lely. It's just uh, things that sort of happened and you stumble life and 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 being curious about where you come from and and explaining and expressing yourself. Yes, yes, we uh, <clears throat> we're doing um, with Divan, we, we're creating, uh, you know, um, you know, since we work with writers, one of our last project is to engage uh, writers from different country or from different genres to engage in dialogue with each other. And uh, a few weeks ago, I was listening to the, the dialogues um, between Lily Hayslip and May, Lee, uh, uh, May Elliot. Uh, I was crying, uh, you know, listening to her story, how much, um, yeah, this things she said really touched me. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, she yeah so we can all learn from, mm -hmm. from each other. What inspired you uh, to go and start Divan? Um, <laughs> um, well, I was, I was as a job, as a professor of Vietnamese American literature, came with the job um, to be the director of a Vietnamese Studies Center at San Francisco State. Um, because, uh, so I organized big event, it was very successful, I brought in money. And um, I didn't understand the politics department, college, get caught in a fire between college and department. And also, I was told very clearly 
by the leadership who happen to be Chinese Americans that I cannot make Vietnamese look better than Chinese. Wait a minute. They they specifically said that to my first event. You know, it was packed. It was full of people. The person in leadership turned around me. She said, "Isabel, you cannot make a Vietnamese look better than Chinese." And was she Chinese American? He's Chinese American. But uh, at the time, I mean, how could they think that that was something that they could have said and get away with it? They said a lot of things and got away with it. I'm not going to get into it, yeah. you know, <clears throat> but it was a lot of, yeah. So the, the day, I, it was a, a nightmare. Um, the day, because anyway, it's just trying to pit people against each other. And I, 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 I never want to say it's my word versus it's your word. So, you know, I, anyway. So the minute I got tenured, uh, which was a fight, I had to work extra, I think. Um, um, I resigned to be uh, the director of Vietnamese Studies Center. And uh, I called Viet and I say, hey Viet, because it was it ink and blood. I say, shall we do it again? Ink and blood, but now we're professors, you know, we both tenures. Maybe we can do big, maybe we can extend to other Vietnamese in other countries. And uh, at the time, the diaspora studies, right, was not popular. I mean, that same person who told me not to make Vietnamese look better Chinese, will each time you see me in a hallway, say, diaspora, diarrhea, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, because this is only one way to, to be Asian Americanist. So, um, so I ask it, you want to go in with me? We do this, we start this organization outside the university, be independent. And we do what we think uh, is good for writers and the communities. And we, because we work as students in, in Cambridge, we you know, understood how each other's thinking and being and is, uh, you know, uh, so we said yes. And that's it. Well, and from there. What was he was the... not famous then. <laughs> Say it again. He was not that famous then. Right. You know? right. Yeah. What What was the directive in your mind like when you first started with Viet? Uh, what What is what, the main mission to, to to accomplish? Well, it was the same as in Can Blood. Was really to uh, you know the recognitions. It come from. You know, in a scholarship, because we're scholars, right? So in a scholarship, we both in different form, right? <clears throat> Identify the problem when it comes to Vietnamese American stories, right? And and, and for me, the, the production of Vietnamese American stories. So uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> the main man. Can we? Right. Are we on? Okay. Okay, so the objective of, of Divan was very similar than Ink and Blood, which is to amplify the story of Vietnamese American writers and to support Vietnamese American writers and make space for Vietnamese American writers. And then we extend it to the diaspora, to other countries outside of Vietnam, you know, uh, France, Australia, Canada, you know, just uh, because um, um, a lot of Vietnamese Americans, uh, I mean, a lot of Vietnamese, their families being uh, scattered in different countries and uh, because of colonialism, because of the war, right? And uh, we believe, or I believe that, um, you know, there's such a polarization uh, around politics, communist versus communism. You know, for me, my impetus, you know, desire to include other uh, writers from other countries and have dialogues, listen attentively to those stories, with also to, to to find another way to have dialogue that is not polemical and then block the discussions. And I thought it would be healthy for the communities to hear what happened to family members through writers from other countries uh, to their stories. Uh, and, and it's been so much 
divisions caused by civil war uh, and colonizations to bring some fresh air and maybe loosen things up a little bit. Um, um, I don't know if reconciliation is is uh, the goal, but uh, some time is an outcome yeah. of this work of bringing people together. It's a great point. It's a great point. Yeah, reconciliation is. Uh, it's like it's it's almost like working towards being happy. You can't work towards being happy. Happy is like the byproduct of living towards your goal of accomplishing something right and then the byproduct hopefully is happiness like maybe in like being married you know you have these little battles and you work hard to kind of figure things out and the byproduct of all that might be a little bit of happiness and i feel like reconciliation when we talk about in the cultural context of our community it's sort of similar to that too there's no rec can't work toward to reconciliation i think that's I don't know. Am I wrong there? It's not the end. It's not. I mean, for me, I'm just going to talk for me and not for Viet here because, you know, it's, it's we know we, we, we see eye to eye, but at the same time, you know, we're different, different. people. Yeah. Uh, I don't to speak for himself, him, but, um, 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 you know, one of the job I did, you know, I told you I had always had plenty of job. I always worked, you know, like so much. Uh, to pay for my schooling and all of that. Uh, one of the job I had is um, working at, at wedding, uh, prepare the food. Catering. And I noticed, you know, a catering. And then I was like, oh, no, people are pretty happy. They eat well, they drink what they drink, and they, they, they dance, they're happy. So one thing I, I, I try to do, you know, um, is is to bring writers from different countries, different generations, maybe uh, maybe even immigration histories, which often led to different ideology um, together around safe space with good food and wine and people talk around the meal and have um, organized events that benefit everyone and uh, and speak with organizers from one group and say, you know, welcome the other side with a smile. You don't have to talk, just welcome, invite people. Uh, doing it uh, that way. And uh, collaboration take place that may never have taken place otherwise because of the legacy, right, of divisions. And then people you know, even like say, oh, I like your work. And you know, you're my parents hated your parents, but with the children, I still don't want to talk to you, but I don't even know why. Uh, but now I'm really enjoying this meal together. I like your work. I, I like to work with you. You know, it's just in 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 writers, storytellers can be the soul of the communities. They can be leader. They can point to directions, and if they can. Uh, work together, speak with it, each other. Maybe it can, you know, it can open it can up. help heal or, or speed up some of that process. But that process is internal and cannot be forced. Yeah, can't rush it. Can rush it. A when bit I, of mind help. Yeah. When <laughs> When, when I first started doing this podcast, I had the same worry that, well, I had a worry that I would be reaching out to the other side, the other side, uh, and, and, and make people angry or, or upset. But as I'm doing this, I just realized we're, that's not even really, should not even be a concern because we are a, we're just humans and we just, there's stories to, the humanity and the the thread that that sort of stitches everybody together is just the uniqueness of the stories and it's almost not even about the vietnamese you know it's just about listening to what people are have gone through as a result of you know the country that they came from and it just all unifies all the stories kind of a there's a unity in the theme of being 
uh, from this place, right? And it's just, the goal is not to, um, it's not to kind of figure out what, I don't, I, I began to stop thinking about what, what we share, you know, as, as the Vietnamese, but just focusing on individuals' lives that happen to come from Vietnam and the stories that come from France, from a, a woman like yourself with a Vietnamese mother and a, and a French father. Those are just very interesting stories that we can learn from the humanity of, of the things that, that have come out of the stories that people tell. Yeah, yeah, and I think who asks the questions uh, makes a difference, you know, and who um, frame and organize uh, those encounter um, make a difference. I mean, uh, I just remember uh, we had we organized an event in 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 San Francisco, and and then we got that beautiful space because um, the poet laureate. Jack, Jack Hirschman's uh, endorse her, uh, endorse her us, right? He right. to talk to me, nah. and then we got the space, and he like the Vietnamese people, and then the day before the event, he say, "Oh, Isabel, I just want to let you know I'm going to bring photograph of the beautiful Vietnamese people," and I say, "Well, which one?" He said, "You know the Vietnamese people." I say, "Which one?" <laughs> right? Because he's a Leninist. And he wanted to bring beautiful pictures of people from the North, the communists. And I say, you cannot bring this in the space. You know, you, you, you know, we are, you know, you going, you know, people, the, the, the artists who show up to that space and you bring those picture of your Vietnamese, beautiful Vietnamese people, they're going to be black mark. You know, they need to have a choice if they want to enter that space, if that's the condition to us to have that space. So I say, you didn't warn me, this is tomorrow. And I say, no. And, and we lost funding and we lost a fund, we lost a space and, you know, and then suddenly it's all these rumors about Isabel, right? I mean, I'm used to rumors, right? The mixed race is like, okay, you know, if I can, you know, I can deal with that. But, um, but it was a loss of opportunities. But, you know, here this work of reconciliation was done in a so, I, I, I'm all for reconciliation and discussing and dialogues, but it has to be done on our own term and in a way that is really informed about the, the, the wounds uh, and the, the scars that, uh, you know, that, that have divided us. Um, so, but your interventions and your openness, uh, I think because you're open and because you're from the communities, and because you're a man, uh, for Vietnamese, it's not so threatening and maybe more people can receive and, and embrace uh, this kind of work. So I commend you to be able to do this and doing it so beautifully. Thank you. Uh, that means a lot to me. And I appreciate you being open and spending the time uh, sitting here with me to, to converse. And I, I hope that this is the, the start of many more conversations with yourself and with you and, and, and other people that you might, you know, um, introduce to me. And, and so we can really form this sort of uh, amplification of, of voices. And I, um, I'm very outspoken about people like you having podcasts um, because it is the more we have, the more podcasts that we have, the more information and the more opportunity we have to discuss in long form. And maybe there's only 20 people listening. Maybe there's 2000 people listening, or maybe there's 10,000 in three years. I, I don't know, but I know that if I'm changing the hearts and minds of one or two people, uh, that's really that matters. And, you know, ultimately I always say this, this is a selfish endeavor. I'm doing this for me first, right? I, because I am really interested in, your life, um, all the little nitty gritty details that are that you giggle about or that you don't want to talk about. I can't wait to read the book. I, you know, these are things that I'm interested in, and I do this for myself first and foremost. And hopefully, if other people like it, the the great. But if not, I mean, I'm I'm enjoying myself, and this is a big reward and you know, big big blessing in my life to 
be able to have somebody like you and, and other uh, people in the community come in and on board and, and sit and talk for a few hours. Yeah, well, thank you for your curiosity and for asking and making space for people like me who didn't think uh, it was uh, it was her place to have a space to speak and be heard. So I don't take that for granted. And thank you. But we we still have a little bit more to go because that was <laughs> okay. <lot> <laughs> okay. that's okay. I didn't mean to close it out, but uh, okay. So so what I, I want to go back to Div Divan and what I'm hearing is. Uh, the diaspora idea was an afterthought. It wasn't something that you and Viet immediately thought of in the beginning. So you didn't call it Divan from the beginning, right? It was it had to be another name or no. But yeah, I forgot the name. Um, I forgot the name at first. Yeah, we so we started to no, but that's a, no, it was not an afterthought. On the first conversations with him, I say, let's do Ink and Blood again, but make it diasporic. Got it. Let's uh, let's enlarge, you know, since we have more power right, as faculties and we're no longer students, let's go big. Right? So he said yes. Um, and then the, the name Divan, you know, we started to gather uh, friends and, and supporters. And then we just sat around my living, living room here and with food and wine and say, okay, let's come up with a name. Um, and then we we came up with all kind of name and and that one sticked um, um yeah i mean it's not the perfect names you know sometimes we're thinking of changing the name um but now there is a name recognition it's kind of a brand to it so now it's like oh uh it'd be a lot of work to change the name um, you know there's when i used to see the name uh i used to be uh, i used to think that you whoever named it named it after a vietnamese phrase uh, called yivang right oh. yivang means to remember i think it means to remember the past oh. i'm not sure i'm not sure but it, it there's a meaning to that uh term i wish i can just google it i wish i had an assistant right here to say can you look up the word yivang <laughs> because it there's a and so i thought oh they're, they're just being very clever that they named this Yibang, right? So every time I look at Divan, I'm thinking, oh, this is just some American pronunciation of the word Yibang, and it makes perfect sense. So we have to figure that out. Uh, yeah. Well, maybe it was part of the discussion because, you know, we have people, you know, obviously who spoke Vietnamese. I mean, we, you know, brainstorm, maybe, maybe it was this. Uh, it also like Divan, you know, like, like a salon, you know, sitting, sitting and you know, divan, you know, when you sit, it's like a French words and and divan is diasporic Vietnamese artist network um, to make it. But the word diasporic now we're thinking is too academic, you know, people sometimes don't know what it is, although it's starting to be more uh, used. Um, yes. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, so maybe it was part of the discussion. I don't remember. But that's great. <laughs> what, what are some of the like, what is the process of, of sort of becoming a member of the, the, the group or like, how does it exist in the world? Uh, is it an organization to bring on and sh spotlight writers and artists? Or is it uh, just a club that people get together for their, a newsletter and there's a discussion? Like what, what exactly, how does it function? So it's growing and it's grown a lot in the last few years. I mean, it really started from my kitchen um, and then having my students get involved in doing the work. Uh, I mean, you know, organizing at events uh, and us selecting people because Viet and I are experts in Vietnamese American literature. So we know a lot of people. So it started with that. Uh, now, you know, 10 years later is becoming more professionalized. We have processes in, in place of finalizing processes in place for selections of writers to, you know, to promote, uh, try to be much more, you know, uh, have different teams uh, flagging different texts, right? So it's not all from us and different writers. Uh, we're just starting this membership uh, 
thing on, on the website so people can become members as community members, as writers, as, uh, as, as students and have access to, uh, you know, to directory, to, to, to workshops, to the accented events, to guidelines for reading, for interpreting text. Um, we have a resource group on Facebook for writers to for writers to speak with each other, artists to speak with each other, build the network. Uh, we, we're growing and always trying to think about, you know, what resources or activity or things that we can create that serve the writers and it's always evolving. Uh, now I'm thinking of, you know, bringing a list of people in the industries, right? That just not writing, speaking with each other, but people with, in Hollywood looking for writers, like agents, publicists, you know, like people who draw picture for, uh, for book covers, right? So really growing and, and it's grow as much as help we can receive from volunteer, but now as we're becoming professional, I mean, I'm really a grassroots organizers who really had been able to mobilize people to do a lot of work for free, right? So, you know, but um, as we're becoming professional and now we're going nonprofit, we're in the process now becoming nonprofit and we've paid staff and it's trying to pay everybody, it's just not the writers and the artists. Um, uh, we're getting people who have um, more professional skills because before it was kind of, you know, all kind, right, of right. people helping, right? So, uh, and that is also helping the organizations uh, to be more uh, robust in terms of inclusion because that's really, I always have to remember the initial goal and, 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 and what drove these organizations to come about. And, and for me, it was really having space for the established writers to show up on the side of emerging writers to, to support them, right? Because, you know, so that uh, it's not so hard for the second generations or third generation than it was for the first generations. So, um, so always remember what the in, initial, uh, uh, you know, fire uh, for creating these organizations to amplify the stories and doing it in a way that is as inclusive as possible. So, um, yeah, so we really want to move away from this idea of club to make it, you know, one is really for our writers. But the more money we receive, the more able we'll be able to uh, make uh, this happen because, uh, you know, a lot of it happened here in this space. You know, we have a, a few staff, but uh, again, we're doing a lot for relatively little money because the way I work, right? Uh, but uh, we need to start to charge more. We need to stop giving everything for free. We need to to value what we put to the table, put a dollar amount, and then with that money, hire professionals so we can actually uh, be better at uh, amplifying the stories and serving the community for all the young people to be proud of being Vietnamese. And that's what we're thinking now is the next generations. How can we use this network to create space for the next generations to understand one's culture and not feel ashamed to be Vietnamese, right? Not to enlist in the army just because out of, you know, wanting to belong, right? right. Um, uh, so they're more free to make their choice, not out of anger or you know but out of 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 peace and that comes it comes you know it take a few generation we like to speed up that process yes <laughs> now what about writers and artists coming out of vietnam is this something that uh, fits the model of what you're doing we're talking about it, right so diaspora right is like Vietnamese outside of Vietnam. So we, we've done that, you know, we're doing it different ways through events, through blogs, through publications, through, you know, uh, different venues, uh, educations. Uh, that's the next question for us. 
and we are in the process of discussing, you know, some Vietnamese writers don't have, are not allowed to express themselves in Vietnam. Or some, you know, uh, young writers who have educations here and go back and some of the issues are similar. And there's a lot of uh, creativity, a lot of young people who are doing amazing creative work. So now we're thinking, uh, do we do it and how we do it? And in a way that is not offensive to the communities, but true to our missions and, and to think, you know, in the future, you know, think of a future, next generation. So we're discussing it, but we're doing it thoughtfully, carefully. I mean, we, we choose no master. We did, we did an event last uh, winter in Vietnam. We were censored. You know, we were doing poetry about our families and we were censored. So, but people wanted us to, you know, writers came to us, organizations come to us, uh, publication house came to us, government's publishing house came to us. But I say, yes, you can come to us, but you cannot censor us. So it's like, okay. <laughs> right? So uh, so we listening, we talking, but we want to do it in a way that is very thoughtful and respectful to the communities and meaningful for the next generation. Because well, that's what matters now. If you drop the D, the diaspora, V-A-N can mean van. Van means prose or... Uh... It, the, van means van hua is culture and there's, you know, there's all these uh, things that you can play with if you drop that d you put a slash there or something <laughs> yeah you can put a slash there <laughs> yeah yeah um, yes no it's it's yeah so it's 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 part of discussion but uh uh we just receive a, a manuscript from bowden to publish so we you know it's, we we're thinking about it Mm -hmm. And that has a profound implication in society, in our community, in our Vietnamese, uh, because there, then there's no other, right? I mean, that, that's how I, I, I wanted to ask you about that, because on some level, I don't want to feel like the other. I don't want to be disconnected from my home. Uh, I both my parents are Vietnamese, and they were born in Vietnam, and they, and I go back a lot. I have a I have businesses there, and I still. You know, my brother lives there for 18 years now and I don't want to have a disconnection I don't want to be I know that in the beginning it's important to have that sort of diaspora label for 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 who I am and my identity but ultimately I want to grow into this but this is just me personally I, I want to become part of Vietnam I want to well I speak the language fluently I I, I do interviews in Vietnamese I want to think like a Vietnamese person. I don't want to have that distinction of being unable to fully grasp what's going on on a from a nyau table to experiencing um, a concert somewhere in Hanoi. I want to be able to fully understand and, and be a part of every aspect of being a Vietnamese, whether it's from the homeland or outside of it. I want, I'm greedy like that. Yes, yes. And, you know, as I say, uh, last winter, no, two winter ago, we went, you know, she was no master, a group of us went there. And then, you know, I haven't gone there for 10 years before. And it's like how Vietnam have changed so fast and it's so dynamic. And I say, you know, for young people, this is better being here than a young person in San Francisco right now. It's so dynamic. and culture is blooming you know I mean writers we talk to writers they feel like they an artist you know feel like they not totally free to express themselves but but um um one thing I have to say what your desire the you know if you look at the body of Vietnamese American literature what is taught as a one about identity, about, you know, being Vietnamese American here, right? That's, you know, in Asian American studies in academia. But if you look at the, at, at the whole 
body of Vietnamese American literature, more of it is about Vietnam, is about memory, is about going back, is about making sense of the past. And those are not taught. So, so you know, if you look at a bookstore on, on our website, right, we, we have like, I don't know what it is now, 120 books, right, by Vietnamese American. And you can see, so your preoccupation is also reflected in Vietnamese American literature because a lot of it is about Vietnam. So those writers, if you look at them, that's pretty Vietnamese literature reflect that because a lot of people go back and travel there and live there and do exchange there and 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 this is there. So the question for us is more what is our relationship to Vietnamese literature by Vietnamese national, right? Because the content about Vietnam is there here the memory of people traveling or visiting and stuff like that. Uh, as I said, I have an idea of the directions, uh, but it's a process and we're going to do it thoughtfully, but it's happening. And I think uh, you, everybody would be enriched by uh, paying attention to how culture grow there because, because of the youth is so much dynamics yeah. and ideas. But there's also a lot of silencing, you know. Uh, w you know, when we met writers, that's all they talk about, right? So, yeah. I I want to sort of wrap it up with uh, a question about um, um, being American, being French, being Vietnamese for you. Uh, I I I don't know how to ask the question where it will. I guess I don't want to ask this simple question because it, it could sound like a simple question, but you have these three very uh, strong identities being Vietnamese, being French, being uh, American. What, how has your perspective changed in the, in the, where you are right now today uh, in relation to those three cultures? Well, as I say, my preoccupations has always been since, I was born with safety, right? Uh, physical safety and mental health safety. Um, and uh, I mean, I have a home in San Francisco, which is amazing. Um, uh, I go to France, people say, oh, you speak pretty good French for a foreigner, right? Uh, and I, you know, a minute I go there, um, I'm boiling, you know. <laughs> uh, what do you mean you're boiling? Uh, I, I, as I said, I still have a bone to chew. You know, I still have some work to do in France to fight racism because uh, it had hurt me deeply and my mother deeply. And uh, actually, I'm interested in organizing uh, riders over there, uh, uh, European Vietnamese riders, bring Vietnamese American riders in dialogues, and have asked questions about race. Because identity politic here, there's some issue with it. It's not perfect. But over there, because it doesn't allow to, there's no language for it, uh, there's really no room to speak about racism and sexism and sexuality of all of, you know, ism. Uh, there is a movement of uh, anti-Asian uh, violence over there that is slowly springing up, but it's really, it could need some support. So I'm, 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 I'm thinking about how to, to give a hand over there uh, because I think I can use what I've learned here uh, the language I've acquired here to uh, uh, to help out uh, those in Asians who are silenced over there and being racist against, you know, experience racism, but also uh, French society. Last time I went there and I spoke um, uh, in at a conference to close a conference. I made very clear, I said, you know what? 
um, because it was issue, there was always issues about, you know, all of a sudden I had 30 minutes, next thing I know I had 10 minutes to speak and say, okay, I say, you know what, uh, I'm not here to, I'm not here to, to ask for your respect. I'm not here to fight for my respect. I'm really here to give you a hand because you guys need some help here. You know, you've colonized those countries. You never plan to have those colonized people to come here. You don't know how to handle it. You know, things are exploding left and right. I think maybe you can hear and listen to what we have to say. And then, you know, next time I come, you'll have to invite me. You know, I'm not, I'm not begging for any respect. Uh, those days are over, so get over it. So wow. I still have some emotion when I speak to a French audience, and uh, I don't want to be driven by these emotions, but I want to use these emotions to be effective in, uh, in maybe, you know, do a part, do my part to fight racism here, as I do it here, through amplifying those stories, but also elsewhere. And, and uh, yes. There, there's something beautiful about uh, all of the struggles and all of the pain points that we uh, experience in the intersectionality of all of this, right? And I think without any of it, life would kind of be dull. I mean, it's not like we wanted to be here or we're looking for it, but the fact that it's here and we're working through it is sort of like the main point of, I think, existing as a human being almost to, right, to kind of figure all this stuff out and work through it and not around it. I mean, it's just to go through it and really grind it out. Yes, grind it out. So it's a different way to grind it out, right? So yes, you know, it's like a lot of anger, right? Fight. Fight. Yes. I, 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 I try to, to what my preoccupation, preoccupation is um, healing, mm -hmm. you know, is, 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 to pay attention to the internal work um, that needs to take place to truly heal and to really feel free and, and to be at the place of, of safety internally. Mm -hmm. and, and then when you have that, you have, and I don't know, you say the word happiness, maybe the happiness is not the goal, but at least this inner peace, of living without fear by whether you come from a country from war uh, or a place where there's a lot of violence that takes place uh, because of who you are. Um, I think that success uh, is to find that place. Uh, yeah, and the place as your question asked between Vietnam us and france right when i go to vietnam you know i, I speak out right <laughs> say, who are you uh so and i don't speak the language so you know so this place here this bubble uh and then when i can feel that the most not always but the most and then use that strength to to you know to to work from that to right. do the work i right. think that's extra work but that's what it is do you have anything else uh, that you'd like to add to our conversation? No, I think you're doing great work. And is there anything that we can do to help you out? You know, we're there. Uh, we have the same goal, which is listening and amplifying the story so people listen to what diversity, complexity, and, and difference even within us. And that is, uh, yeah. Yes, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for spending the time with me today. And uh, hopefully we will be um, speaking together again very soon. Okay. Thank you, Isabel. Okay. Bye, Kenneth. Thank you for listening to The Vietnamese with Kenneth Nguyen. The Vietnamese is produced by Brittany Tran and Javier Proenza. Special thanks to Jane Nguyen, Catherine Nguyen, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Christo Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at the Vietnamese podcast. You can also find us on YouTube where you can subscribe, like, and comment. Please rate and give us a review wherever you find our podcast. Thanks again for listening.